afternoon, everyone. It's great to see all of you here. I think I know just about everybody in the room. Um, but uh, for those of you I don't know, my name is Susan McTiernan. I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of the Gavelli School of Business here at Roger Williams University. Um, I cannot believe this great turnout given the storm. The CAFE alums are definitely a brave bunch of people for coming out in this weather to be with us for this very special event, which is one of my favorites at the university every year. Uh, we're looking forward to a great presentation from the current CAFE students, and I know you all are looking forward to a great rest of your day and evening. Um, I would like to recognize a couple of people who have joined us from uh, the University Administration. President Donald Farish is with us today. President Farish. <laughs> Vice President for University Advancement, Lisa Rayola, is here. right up front, so that's why I can't see you. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to this wonderful group of students who we'll be hearing from for the next hour or so, and I will get back with you after their presentation with a couple of more thoughts and comments. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you guys, okay? <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean McTiernan. Welcome, everybody, to this semester's CAFE portfolio presentation. My name is Clayton Caggiano, and to my left, we have Zachary Morin, and to my right, Sean Sweeney. We make up the associate directors of this semester's CAFE program. Now, usually, if you guys have been to a CAFE portfolio presentation, we usually show you guys both growth and value. However, today, we're going to be doing something a little different and just presenting to you guys our growth portfolio. Before we begin, we'd like to preface you a certain situation that happened to us in the CAFE. The best way to describe a semester is to break it up into two time frames. At the beginning, our growth fund was positioned to run the bull market, and our performance showed that. However, recently we've seen sectors move, or sorry, we, we've seen money move from high evaluated sectors to lower evaluated sectors. And then these eight student fund managers had to reallocate nearly 50% of our growth fund in just these past five days. The experience that these student fund managers before you have experienced is nothing that has happened before in the tenure of the program. Quite frankly, it's something that we don't ever want to happen again. And to begin, I'd like to invite up Sarah, Paul, and Corinne to begin the presentation. Now before we start, I just wanted to thank uh, Clayton, Zach, and Sean for just such a great job that they've done with us as associate directors. They really have given us so much experience and knowledge that we've used, and without them it would have been possible, so thank you so much, guys. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight you're standing in front, or you're in front of eight student fund managers who have experienced a semester unlike no other in the CAFE program. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we have experienced the highs and the lows of this market as we mirrored industry in a way that not only developed us as students, but also gave us real world experience and showed us how this business can often be very harsh. Um, due to, in this sense, we um, consistently were doing our due diligence and fulfilling three rules right away when we came to this program as we were acting as not only student fund managers, but analysts fund managers as well as traders. We first met on a Wednesday and by Thursday we had our first assigned all-nighter. During this all-nighter, we came up with probabilities and scenarios we thought were likely throughout the semester. We thought this would prepare us for anything, but as we soon realized, no, nothing can prepare you for the market. In our chaos web, we placed likely scenarios in green and the unlikely scenarios in red. Some of the major topics we discussed were Trump's agenda, corporate earnings, the direction of oil prices, as well as the effects of Hurricane Harvey. At the beginning of the semester, we did not believe that oil prices would rise above $60, $50. However, throughout the semester, we saw them rise up to $60, which directly affected the energy sector as it went from lagging to leading. As Karina just mentioned, Hurricane Harvey was huge for our group because this was the first time that we really had to act, uh, react to the market as a collective unit to make changes for what we were seeing. At this time, we were looking at short-term and long-term opportunities for us to capitalize on, such as changes within the oil and gas uh, prices, as well as changes within consumer and discretionary sectors as consumer spending patterns were starting to change. The chaos theory allowed us to anticipate how events such as this would impact the market. It also allowed us to gauge if the bull market would continue to year end or we see a slight correction. Over the course of the first 235 trading days, 
we saw the bull market continue on its path and drive companies' prices upwards. This can be shown in our correlation matrix, and the boxes showed in red display high correlation between two companies. At this time, it wasn't a problem for our portfolio, as all prices were moving in a positive direction. Now, with this level of irrational exuberance in the market, it's safe to say that we were constantly busy throughout the semester, as we use an active management strategy. With a strategy like this, we're able to monitor both of our portfolios throughout every single minute of every single trading day, ensuring that our portfolios are performing in line with our objectives. Now, there was a lot of gains that we did see from using this strategy, and it did contribute heavily to our performance. However, it doesn't work in some scenarios, like when you go to Greece, for example. While we had an amazing time in Greece, we still had to actively manage both of our portfolios as we were getting fun performance every day from our future student fund managers. However, one day that we did not have access to our funds was when we were traveling home, so we had to take a passive approach for just one trading day. While we were all relaxing on the plane, we were completely unaware of the changes in the market as investors began to take their money from high valuation tech and healthcare companies into lower valuation financials and consumer discretionary companies. This change within the market showed investors taking profits on companies that have seen sufficient price appreciation over the year. Now with our funds positioned towards the older trends that we were seeing in the market, let's just say when we landed in Boston, turned on our phones, and checked the previous day's closing report, it wasn't a very warm welcome home. In fact, we had underperformed the S&P 500 by 1.74% in just one day alone. This is what we like to call the perfect storm. Everything we had previously known had changed and we had to reallocate our portfolio accordingly. Companies that were leading our portfolio for the entire year were now underperforming as investors were looking for lower value companies. Also, sectors such as energy, which were lagging, became leading on news of OPEC production cuts that boosted stock prices. Expectations of the corporate tax reform started to drive industries such as banking and transportation as they would benefit the most. Also, Chinese tech companies had just come off of their worst performing week as the Chinese government began tightening rules on lending. Now, if we backtrack to the beginning of our semester, there was some skepticism within the market as there really was a dissension between fundamentals and stock price valuations. However, there was no telltale signs to us that showed that it was stopping anytime soon. Cons investors were consecutively buying these dips, driving price points even higher on a day-to-day -day basis. And with that, we were a bit confused at times, but we utilized a top-down approach in order to look at the entire globe to ensure that we were covering all our bases, making sure that we weren't missing any information that could have told us that this repositioning was occurring. And of course, the only way that you can start such an analysis is through an in-depth <coughs> international as well as domestic outlook. In our domestic analysis, we looked at trends such as M2, consumer sentiment, unemployment, and GDP to come to the consensus that as a group, we were moderately bullish on the economy moving forward. We then looked at these trends worldwide and saw favorable ones in the China and the Eurozone. Utilizing this top-down approach allowed us to key in on specific areas with driving tailwinds as well as analyze global markets. We then evaluated on an industry-specific level and evaluated companies through a fundamental, technical, and behavioral analysis. Now, with taking this approach to the market, you're able to key in on specific areas as well as sectors that you feel might outperform others. Although that this did pay off for us in the beginning of the semester as we were running with the bull market, with this reallocation and repositioning amongst investors that we've discussed, essentially the market had taken our weightings that had been so tried and true to us and turned a positive into a negative. We would now like to introduce you to our growth holdings. The one in bold are the one that we just had to recent reallocate in our fund and we'll explain why you see some negative holding period yields on your fact sheets. Also, when looking at a five-day correlation matrix, you can see that now none of our companies are running too correlated together, which was essential when we were doing our portfolio reallocation. We would now like to begin our holding discussion and talk about some major changes we've made in the last three trading days. Now, starting with the telecom sector, this was a sector that up until a week ago, we chose to avoid altogether. Based on our original top-down analysis moving to year-end, we felt that the sector lacked the key catalysts and growth drivers moving forward in order to generate adequate returns for our fund. Our top-down analysis proved true throughout our semester all the way up until the last week and was a key success driver within our fund. Uncertainty surrounding mergers and acquisitions paired with price competition within the industry were two of the main reasons we decided to underweight this sector. However, the S&P's weighting of this sector is 2%. We chose to allocate this elsewhere as we felt the downside outweighed the upside. The fundamentals within the sector simply did not meet our investment criteria as companies' balance sheets were showing rising costs and shrinking profits. 
This was due to intense pricing pressure taking place within the uh, sector, where companies had to slash prices in order to remain competitive with their peers. This led to an overall loss of brand loyalty for these companies, as customers were just simply looking for the lowest price that they could find. Three of the four major competitors within, within the industry were facing uncertainty surrounding mergers and acquisitions throughout our semester. T-Mobile and Sprint were in active talks, and we saw that every time a news headline came out surrounding those mergers, that there was a price swing that was usually to the downside. Now, AT&T is another company actively pursuing a merger and acquisition with their recent agreement to acquire Time Warner Cable. This deal is in an attempt to boost their entertainment offerings as they're rapidly losing market share to companies like Netflix and Hulu. Now, this would be a fantastic addition for the company, but the deal was just recently hit with an antitrust lawsuit that has put the entire merger in jeopardy. And as you can see, this has created a tremendous amount of volatility for the stock, and this was just simply too much company-specific risk for us to take on within our fund. This leaves us with Verizon, the company we have recently decided to add to our portfolio given the recent market shift we've seen. One reason being that Verizon is the third highest tax company within the S&P 500. Given that the recent tax cuts have gone through the House and Senate, we think this will dramatically increase Verizon's bottom line and one reason we wish to hold them within our portfolio. On top of this, the company just reported a fantastic quarter where they added over 700,000 wireless subscribers to their network. Their superior network speeds, competitive prices, and strong fundamentals make us extremely confident in the company moving into 2018. And the strength of the company can also be seen by looking at their churn rate, which is the lowest amongst their peers. The churn rate indicates how many subscribers are moving one net from one network to another. This paired with their subscriber growth shows that we have confidence going with this company moving forward. We would now like to transition this from our lowest weighted sector to our highest weighted technology. Now moving on to our most significant weighting, it is impossible for any investor to ignore the gains achieved this year in the technology sector, and for the majority of the year, was driving our fund forward. Although investors knew valuations were extended, money continued to pour in. They justified these prices by believing these companies had long-term catalysts that would drive growth moving forward, delaying the inevitable rotation out of tech. Unfortunately, we saw this rotation out of tech within our holding within the past few weeks, and we saw tech drop almost 4% in just, over, in just under three days. With this being said, we knew with our new reallocation, we needed to stick with what we thought was tried and true throughout our entire analysis, making specific metrics that we knew each single company we were evaluating fell within, such as a high EPS growth rate as well as a low peg ratio. We're currently invested in six companies within the technology sector. Among our positions, we chose to focus on Checkpoint, Alibaba, and T Connectivity, as we feel these holdings are solid, more properly valued, and will be of interest to talk about today because of their long-term catalysts. As we've just discussed, we clearly see that the tech sector has run with the bulls throughout our holding period. And because of this, we want to focus less on the companies that have ran with the bull market throughout the earlier sector, and we want to focus on the companies we've recently reallocated into that we see growth drivers for through the future. One of our new positions with considerable catalyst for growth is TE Connectivity. TE is a leader and supplier of passive electronics, specifically harsh environment connectivity products. These are the products that are uh, heat resistant and heavy duty like the ones found in automobiles, planes, among other applications. Not only has TE seen a favorable demand environment, they've also seen strong sales execution, shown in their consistent price appreciation over the past four quarters. We've also seen them continue to expand and diversify across their many industries, showing they have healthy growth and price movement for the years to come. Their main driver is increased electronics adoption in automobiles, accounting for nearly 40% of total sales. The advancement of driver assistance programs, as well as the increased adoption of electric vehicles, are both significant catalysts for connectivity and sensor products. These segments are boosting electric content revenue by two to three times the pace of auto production. Now, to put this simply, even if we were to see an environment of slowing or constant auto sales and production, TE is still going to benefit from these trends, as the product per vehicles is constantly increasing with new technology and electric components being put into these vehicles every single day. We also see companies are constantly looking for innovations to increase the safety, fuel efficiency, as well as usability with these ca uh, cars, increasing their price per car. Just think, doesn't it seem like yesterday that we had crank windows in our car, and now they're literally driving themselves? We see that TE has perfectly, ca perfectly capitalized on these trends, and we see growth moving forward. Industrial, fiber optic, and aerospace segment segments are also benefiting from this trend and are seeing favorable long-term growth. Commercial airline and fleet modernization are long-term catalysts for TE's uh, aerospace and defense segments, with new content to focus on real-time monitoring, electronic controls, and in-flight entertainment. 
Within this new fund, we also wanted to focus on companies that had international exposure, and TE fit this bill completely, showing almost perfect diversification across three different regions, the United States, Europe, as well as the Asia-Pacific region. While we did take into consideration all these analysis tools, we wanted to focus heavily on technical analysis of this company, as we saw that with our new consumer sentiment market, we wanted to make sure that it was 100% the correct time to buy in. On a yearly chart, the trend is clearly up, with price accelerating during our holding period. The tech sell-off we experienced last week did not affect TE as severely as it did for many others, illustrating its superior downside protection. Price remained above its support line, shown here in green, as well as a 50-day simple moving average, highlighted in red. These factors together indicated uh, sustainable growth, as well as perfectly fit our new emphasis of lower valuation, catalyst-driven technology picks. Another company we felt met this same metric is Checkpoint. Checkpoint is a company that we invested in early on in the semester, and we were confident about the cybersecurity-wide trends that we were seeing. With this said, as all the alumni in the um, audience know, we perform an in-depth earnings analysis on every single company, ensuring that they see the risk is outweighed by the potential reward. The first indicator that we might want to reevaluate Checkpoint is when their direct competitor, Fortinet, reported earnings a few days prior. They saw a price dip of over 3%, even after announcing lower year guidance, as well as an EPS um, surprise of over 20%. With this said, we knew that this was company-specific risk, but Checkpoint's price also dropped that same day, indicating a possible cybersecurity-wide trend. Along with this concern, expectations for delayed product cycles, as well as $30 million in lost revenue from mandatory company shutdown for Israeli holiday Yom Kippur, added to the consensus for increased earnings risk. The stock price was also trading above the set target price, indicating sufficient downside, further adding to our decision to take our profits. Our due diligence paid off when we sold Checkpoint, and later the stock sold off more than 12%. Because of our original love for this company, we knew that we wanted to revisit them and reevaluate them while we were repositioning our new fund. With this said, we saw that with their earnings drop, as well as the, the tech sell-off, they were now properly priced and set for growth. We also saw that their PE levels were now properly set as well, um, showing that we thought they had extreme growth products in the future. One of the major reasons we like Checkpoint in the first place is increased demand for cybersecurity services, given the industry has a compound annual growth rate of 8.47%. Businesses and consumers have faced a siege of sophisticated cyber attacks, putting companies' reputation and financial well-being at risk, further making Checkpoint services that much more appealing. Based off of all the things that Dylan and I discussed with you all, we are excited to say that we did indeed invest back into Checkpoint, and we're excited about the growth catalyst moving this company forward through with our new fund. Moving on to our last tech company, we wanted to step away from some of the bigger known tech names, the companies that we even hold in our fund, such as Facebook, and talk about a lesser known company to the average individual. While you may have heard of Alibaba, you may not know why it's poised for growth over some more well-known domestic tech companies. In our fund, we look for international exposure into markets we have confidence in. Staying consistent with our top-down approach, we view the Chinese tech sector as an area with high growth opportunities, specifically in the bats, or the Chinese version of the fangs. Now, to a specifically fundamental analyst, this company may have been overlooked due to their high uh, valuation at about 56 times. But that being said, we compare them to their well-known domestic competitor, Amazon, who is currently trading at the second highest PE in the entire S&P 500 index. We knew that this meant that they were better poised for growth within the sector, opposed to Amazon. We also saw that the e-commerce industry as a whole was trading at an extreme premium, making Alibaba the perfect fit in an industry that we knew we could not miss out on. The availability and relatively low cost of telecom networks in China has greatly contributed to the increased popularity of online shopping. This has also enabled mobile device users to surge, enhancing the retail experience and online brand engagement, suggesting an internet everywhere approach to shopping. Alibaba has recently hit $3 trillion in sales, an amazing feat that they happen to have come upon in only 13 years in the business. To put this into perspective, giant Walmart took 54 years to hit this same metric. We also looked at the packages and the processing that these companies are processing each day, and Alibaba is currently processing over 12 million packages a day, compared to Amazon's 3 million. In addition to this, we saw China as a great spot for growth, as they are currently representing over 28% of the mobile and online retailing industry, while the United States only accounts for around 12%. Another area of the market where we stressed our top-down approach and emphasized lower valuations was in consumer discretionary. We'd now like to invite up Pete and Ashley to discuss our holdings within the sector. 
With regard to our weightings and consumer discretionary, we decided that we wanted to undervalue the sector. These reasons included the fact that we expected weak outlook and overall holiday retail sales, a decrease, of, a decrease in retail competition, as well as overall trends in which personal spending would decline. As the semester wore on though, these increased outlook and news and metrics showed that consumer spending was increasing, as well as an overall outlook in the holiday retail season was also going up. This led us to reevaluate our position and become market weight rather than underweight within this sector. This shift away from technology's high valuations led investors to cheap companies within the undervalued consumer discretionary sector. This sector had been previously beaten down and neglected due to weak sentiment heading into the fourth quarter and a less than impressive earnings season. Now what you need to understand is that with millennials driving the sector, there has been a shift in spending from material spending to experiential spending. People would rather buy memories and objects. Due to this shift in the market, we decided to take a step back and reevaluate our holdings. One of the things we did was reevaluate our through our top-down approach analysis, in which we evaluated all the companies we held and decided that we need to sweep them for new companies that better fit our approach. One of the examples of this is Lear Corporation, a company within the auto parts industry that we decided to sweep for was Wind Resorts. Wind Resorts is a casino and hotel operator that has places all across the globe, in which we felt this better exemplified the fit for experiential spending rather than material spending that Ashley mentioned before. Now, Wynn Resorts has consistently outperformed the industry for the whole year. The best part about casinos is their all-encompassing nature. You go there, you get gaming, lodging, entertainment, eatery, and drinks. What more could you need? By purchasing Wynn Resorts, we gave ourselves exposure to two major tourist hubs for the price of one. Domestically, Las Vegas has been revitalizing itself and seen an increase in visits year over year. Due to a decrease in the unemployment rate and an increase in consumer spending, people will turn to casinos for their all-inclusive enjoyment. Also, Wynn is also a major player in Macau, an autonomous region that's part of China near Hong Kong, which is the only place within the country where gambling is legal. We'd like Wynn to do the fact that it just recently built a fully integrated casino resort within this area in the Katai Strip. The Katai Strip is important due to the fact that it's an up and coming similar to Las Vegas, and we feel as if this region is going to continue driving Wynn forward. If you look at the company's quarter over quarter spending, People, more people are visiting this country and this region in order to increase, in order to go gambling and spend their money. The reason is that more people are focused on material spending rather than, are focused on experiential spending, excuse me, rather than material spending. We expect to see this increase as time goes on through the fact that more people are going to this region. Now while we are seeing this shift in spending, there is still an inevitability in fourth quarter retail growth. As U.S. consumers, we need to realize that our shopping trends follow those of Europe and Asia by at least 18 months. Watching the success of companies like Zara and H&M, we set out to find the next big thing, and we found it. Fast retailing is one of these examples in which we found that company that manufactures and designs its own retail clothing line that caters to both men and women. This company operates within three main business segments, Nikko Japan, Nikko Global, as well as Global Brands. Headquartered in Japan, we felt this company had growth potential due to the fact that it was catering to a wide customer base in Asia with over 300 millennials, as well as plans to expand internationally. Already Asia's largest retailer, the company seeks no less than to become number one in the world by 2020. To do so, they're leveraging their quality products and aggressive pricing with their international expansion and acquisition schedule. In addition, due to their foreign country of domicile, the company is exempt from trading that is centered around the corporate tax rate. Sources of growth for fast retailing include India and the United States. Already, they're planning on expanding to both of these countries due to the fact that previously they're untapped for the company, as it already has a strong market within Asia. We expect this growth to continue, and they're using the strategy of coming in with lower prices and higher quality goods in order to develop and build their brand among a wider customer base that caters to multiple segments of people. Feeling so confident in the industry, we decided to add to our holdings. In order to capitalize on the best position companies, we decided to move away from domestic producers that are tied to a more income, middle income consumer and target a more luxurious market. This led us to Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, a French conglomerate and the world's largest producer of luxury goods. Their brands not only embody the good life and everything flashy, but as many as the moms in the room can attest to, they make a beautiful handbag. Compared to fast retailing, which is rapidly expanding in the United States, Louis Vuitton has already established brand with a strong loyalty and a prominent exposure within our country. Heading, when looking at Louis Vuitton, what you want to see is cyclical year-over-year -year seasonal growth. When one of the companies like this, due to the fact that it's cyclicality, you want to see the growth in the second half of the year due to the fact that it's a luxury good and the, during the holiday retail season, you want to see that expanding. 
And due to the fact that the revenues of this are increasing year over year, we felt this company was a strong pick for our fund. When you compare both fast retailing and Louis Vuitton, they both are diversified due to the fact that they're in multiple segments within the industry, with one being luxury goods, and the other one being in a mid-segment retailer. Also, due to the fact that geographic segmentation is different, we have confidence in both companies heading towards year end. When looking at our consumer discretionary holdings, we decided to sweep a lot of our changes and to change our weighting. When looking at consumer staples, we decided to keep our holdings as well as maintain the weighting we had at the beginning of the semester. As our parents always ask, do you want this or do you need this? That's the difference between consumer discretionary and consumer staples. Consumer discretionary, these are the things that we want. The things we siphon money away from our parents to pay for. Consumer staples, these are the things we need. The groceries we occasionally buy with our grocery money. We decided to be market weight in consumer staples due to its ability to hedge against loss on days that the market is driven down by behavioral news centered around Trump's administration, possible tax reform, and geopolitical turbulence. We have found the sector to be the ultimate balancing act within a market that continues to reach new highs but also experiences volatile behavioral swings. Within a sector that thrives on economic uncertainty, we still pick th stocks that will thrive regardless due to their internal growth catalysts and ability to outperform all of their competitors. Walmart has been able to exceed our expectations and position itself to compete with Amazon. By offering order online and pick up in store, this company has been able to use their developed infrastructure in order to increase the speed consumers are able to buy their products. Also, Walmart's acquisition of Jet.com allows them to expand their e-commerce platform and propel their online inventory they are offering. Due to these factors, Walmart has, been, has seen considerable growth and we expect to see the growth continue into 2018. Now you have Walmart that sells paper, towel and to paper towels and toilet paper, but has earned the nickname Wall Monster. The company is continuing to grow and grow, competing in a realm that it never has before. We're seeing Walmart morph into a virtual mall, even taking a dig at Amazon, saying that it's better to be a marketplace than an empire. Go online, look up Walmart, and you'll be amazed by their innovations. If you're too lazy to go gro grocery shopping, just like I am, now you can use their online grocery curbside pickup service. If you're sick of waiting in long lines, their automated towers can retrieve your online orders in a matter of seconds. The company can also afford to sell their goods at prices cheaper than Amazon because their buy online, pick up in store tactic has eliminated the majority of their shipping and handling costs. The second company that we've decided to persistently keep on our fund is Constellation Brands. While some of you may be unfamiliar with this company, most of you will be familiar with their brands. This company is an international marketer and producer of a variety of beers, wines, and spirits. Some of their brands include Svedka, Corona, and Robert Mondavi Wines. We like this company due to the fact that the company has strong fundamentals compared to its peers and its competitor. Heading into 2018, we see the company adding more brands as well as being able to build off its new products it plans on creating and continuing growth through this app. Now staying on top of the whole millennial trend, there's been a shift towards more specialized beers and wines. While we can't give ourselves exposure to the extremely profitable cannabis industry, we can give ourselves indirect exposure through Constellation Brands creation of a cannabis infused beer. By having Constellation Brands in our portfolio, we will experience growth in a sector that hasn't competed, compared that well to the market. Now let's shift gears and discuss a sector that we're extremely confident of throughout our entire time in the cafe. And my personal favorite, financials. Now although we did cons consistently keep a consistent weighting within this area of the market, it's not to say that we didn't sweep out some of our old holdings for some new companies that we felt were better poised for the market that we were seeing. Some of the key indicators that we loved throughout our entire semester in the financial sector were the cheap valuations as well as the increasing uh, probability of tax reform. One of the first changes we made to our previous holdings was sweeping Discover for our previous holding Visa. Visa had been trading at a price that was about 30 times its earnings and Discover gave us the exposure into the credit sector that we believe would best exhibit growth over the long term. We then compared Discover to its direct competitor Capital One and as these metrics may seem similar, we decided to choose Discover due to their lower risk associated with the asset. The next decision that we had to make was to cut City and Blackstone Group. Now Blackstone Group is an asset management company that although did show future catalysts moving forward, wasn't performing as well throughout our holding period due to the fact that there wasn't a lot of volatility within the economy. And that ultimately just minimized the need for their services. Additionally, asset management as an entire industry was the most overvalued area of the financial sector, ultimately forcing us to look elsewhere for cheap profits. 
The last change that we made was taking our profits on Citigroup as they had a solid holding period, as well as revenues that, in, that went into other sectors that we thought were best posed for growth in the financial sector. We then added Morgan Stanley and PNC into our fund. PNC generates its revenues from retail and corporate banking, while Morgan Stanley caters to the global asset management side. We believe that both of these companies will exhibit growth due to the tax reform because they have some of the highest effective tax rates. The last financial holding that we want to present to you guys today is S&P Global, or SPGI. Now this is a company that Corinne and I have loved from the beginning of the semester due to their responsiveness to economic trends and indicators, such as responding well to low interest rate fluctuations, lower PE multiples within the market, as well as tax reform. Now this is a company that, that provides financial services as well as data analytics to the clients within the industry and have consistently grown their demand for their niche financial product. Adding on to this, the company has seen an increased boost in revenues as well as they have minimal competition as they only have two other companies that cater to the same business segments that they do. The reason why we chose SPGI over its competitors was due to their strong margins and higher growth potential. Now if you look at SPGI in the beginning of our semester, this company looks very attractive with over an 8% return potential as well as fantastic analyst recommendations. Now, although this is attractive, if you look at where the price is at today, you'll see exactly what Corinne and I are talking about and the way that this company has consistently responded to the change in market trends that it was facing. While it might seem like there is not much growth potential left, this company still has a 7% return potential along with strong, strong bullish analyst recommendations. While we did hold this company within our fund at the beginning of the semester, we reevaluated it and we still believe that there is immense growth potential left. We now want to switch gears and look at the real estate sector. Now this is an area that Corinne and I battled about throughout the entire semester about whether or not it was even worth investing in, as there was minimal things driving it, not a lot of big things moving within it. However, after we conducted some due diligence, what we found is that there is areas of this market that can drive it forward, and one of those areas being industrial REITs. Typically, on a risk to reward basis, the real estate sector generates the lowest amount of returns for the greatest amount of risk. However, we still decided to market weight this sector as we believe we have truly found a company that represents a needle in a haystack. That being Prologis. Now, this is a company that has outperformed the sector, ETF by our upwards of 14% throughout our holding period and since our buy-in date. Prologis, for those of you who don't know, Prologis provides distribution facilities to manufacturers, retailers, as well as logistic providers, including some big names that you guys might be familiar with. In addition, this company had a fantastic balance sheet with extreme liquidity, as seen by their immense amount of cash and total assets to cover their existing debt obligations. Prologis has been able to generate increasing cash inflows in order to maintain and grow company operations. One of the main reasons why this company has been able to generate these operating cash flows was due to their acquisition of KTR Capital Partners in 2015. Now if you'll look at their cash flow investing activities, you'll see a significant capital deployment. Now although this is risky for the company to go out on a limb and put this much cash on the street, you'll see that they leveraged it to increase their revenues with cash flows increasing at an increasing rate. And they had solidified their position within a rock solid market and narrowed the margins between themselves and their customers in some of the world's most highly populated regions. Some of these locations include Los Angeles and New York City. Exposure to these areas has allowed Prologis to dedicate and detailed to the e-commerce industry, including companies such as Amazon and Walmart, as they have high demand for e-commerce products. Well, you may think REITs are exciting. Let me show you something that's truly exciting. Basic materials. Leono Basil has a 26% for us on the year. This company is a producer of plastics that have a variety of applications, including construction materials, as well as biofuels. We like this company heading towards year end, mostly due to the fact that their growth within China, as well as being in operating in 80 different countries. Within China, we're looking at growth for three, for a, set, for a, three cup, for a couple of reasons. One is that they just recently completed a manufacturing plant within this country that is due to the demand of rising electric costs. Going into earnings season, we conducted our due diligence and found several potential suites to lie in Del Basil. Don't get me wrong, 
These sweeps had huge growth potential, but they also had extremely large swings after earnings. In, a, in an attempt to preserve our alpha, we decided to keep Lionel Basil due to a safer earnings history compared to competitors, strong fundamentals, and catalysts for growth, growth moving forward. We also decided to hold Leonardo Basil due to the fact that we saw a significant price appreciation that outperformed the market. <coughs> and even though we saw this price appreciation, its PE ratios did not see a significant increase. This is due to the fact that the company's earnings matched the price appreciation, meaning that the company remained properly valued within our fund. Therefore, this company not only outperformed the market, but still remained valued in this continued growth heading into 2018. Now, we don't want the excitement to end just yet, so we're going to cover utilities. We determined that this sector was not going to be a place for explosive growth, but other than that, it's going to be a continuous grower, as well as a hedge against the downturn, the down days in the market. With that being said, we decided we wanted to stay market weight in this to capitalize on that hedge against the risk. We decided to invest in Aqua America, a water and wastewater utility that segments in the southeast region of the United States. We bought in in early February, and we still see them to be a continuous growth driver for our fund. Throughout the year, we have seen its exceptional growth, outperforming the utilities ETF by over 10% since our buy-in date. Acquisitions are a key uh, play for utilities in order to grow as it expands networks and user bases, and Aqua America is a leader in this category. We have seen this company over the past five years complete over 84 mergers and acquisitions, showing they're extremely dedicated to their inorganic growth, with increasing their market share as well as their customer base on an increasing basis. We also like their self-sustaining self -sustaining model, as they only rely on outside resources for their water for 8% of their water, as opposed to their direct competitors being in the 20 to 30 times range for this exact metric. These factors, along with, with its ability to hedge against systematic risk in the market, are some of the reasons why we chose WTR for our fund. Now we'd like to transition over to a sector and positions we all hopefully find a little bit more exciting. Our healthcare analysts will now discuss some of our great positions. Now the, uh, the healthcare holdings currently in our fund were not the companies that we held throughout the entire semester. The companies displayed behind me were our actual holdings for the majority of the time that we were in CAFE. But we've, as we've mentioned, we had to shift our focus away from more highly valued stocks into more lower valuations. This was especially crucial for the healthcare sector, which is currently trading with a forward PE of 35 times. Now this led us to the tough decision to sell one of our top performing holdings on the year, Align Technologies. Align produces and sells the Invisalign, a clear retainer system used to correct teeth misalignment and is rapidly taking market share from traditional wire braces as the convenience and cosmetic benefits of the product. When we held Align, we saw an over 123% holding period yield, one of the highest in cafe history and something we are extremely proud of as a group. <coughs> However, during that same time, we saw their PE stretch from 41 times to 73 times. Now we had reevaluated the company at 50, 60, and 70 times earnings, but each time we saw the company, company's growth as unbeatable with absolutely no end in sight. However, when the company hit 73 times earnings, we saw many investors start to take profits as the company began to sell off. So at 123%, we decided to forego our greed and take that and put it into a more undervalued company within the sector. This led to our decision to buy Abbott Laboratories, a company that manufactures and sells healthcare products that are sold worldwide and is trading with a forward PE of 22 times. When we were looking for a healthcare company for a sweep, we wanted to find a company that had diversified revenue streams in order to protect us from the uncertainty surrounding the healthcare bill. Abbott did just that with the revenue streams stemming from nutrition, diagnostics, pharmaceuticals, to medical devices. Now, Abbott last quarter posted double-digit revenue growth in both their medical device and pharmaceutical segments. And this is exactly the type of rapid expansion that we look for within our growth holdings. On top of this, their nutrition segment, which accounts for roughly 33% of their revenue, is exactly the type of the, the diversification we were looking for against the potential downsides of the sector. On top of their diversified revenue streams, Abbott has recently acquired Allier, a global manufacturer of rapid point-of-care diagnostics equipment, and through this acquisition should solidify their leadership within the diagnostic space. Since the acquisition has gone through in October, Abbott has said that they will see $475 million added to the company's top line before year-end. On top of this, Abbott also acquired St. Jude Medical in January, and since that time the two companies have had a seamless transition. This merger has allowed Abbott to compete in every single aspect of the cardiovascular market, which generates over $30 billion each and every year. The combined product portfolio will add great value to Abbott's existing customers. Also, since the acquisition, they have already seen profits and management is now focused on expanding their product portfolio and reaching financial objectives 
and has already raised full year guidance for 2017. Now this type of fundamental and behavioral analysis was absolutely crucial to our success throughout the semester. But we also had to keep in mind what the street was saying as well. Looking at analyst recommendations from Bloomberg, we could see 14 buy ratings with an average price target set just below $62 a share. This implies an 11% return potential and is just one more reason why we wish to hold the company moving forward. We would now like to introduce you to one of our final healthcare holdings that we are very excited to share with you all today. Thermo Fisher is a company that provides or, um, analytical, or, well, analytical services to organizations worldwide. Now, one of the main drivers for the company moving forward is their impressive sales growth in China, which was nearly 20% in their last quarter. This was driven by China's five-year plan focusing on food and other safety measures, and this should be a continuous growth driver for their products moving forward. On top of this, this is a prime example of our use of the top-down approach, as we were extremely bullish on the, chi on the Chinese economy moving into year-end. The company is seeing revenue growing in China at a compound annual growth rate of 17% from 2011 to 2016. They are expecting continue to see this demand, so they have recently opened a, a place there to pro facilitate their growing demand lines there. We would now like to switch gears to our industrial sector, an area where we see growth towards year end. One of the biggest decisions we have made this semester was to continually overweight our exposure within the industrial sector. Some of the key macroeconomic trends that we saw moving till year end were increased infrastructure and defense spending, new housing starts, as well as home rebuilds after the hurricanes. Now with all these economic indicators working in the favor of the sector, we really did feel that the majority of our previous holdings were very strong picks. And adding Stanley, Black & Decker in early October, we felt that with our original positions, Raytheon, Masco, as well as Xylem, we were positioning ourselves for a sustainable growth as we headed towards the year end. First company we'd like to talk about is building products company, Masco. This company was severely affected by the three hurricanes that hit North America in September. After they released earnings, they saw an initial price drop. However, the price shot back up as investors knew this was only short term and would drive their products moving forward. Looking to add a technical chart, you'll see exactly what Corinne is just talking about. It's after earnings, the price depreciated slightly, but then bounced back up as volume was moving in a bullish direction, as also the MACD crossed the signal line in a bullish manner. For us, this signified that sentiment was up, as was price momentum, and we should continue holding the company within our fund. As we evaluated Masco further, we knew that their high demand for their products outweighed all of these factors, and moving forward, this, pro this company would provide us with significant gains. Backtracking to our chaos theory that we conducted in the beginning of the semester, home improvement was always an area that we thought would benefit from the hurricanes that we saw earlier this year. Having seen the price appreciation of Masco, as well as the returns within our fund, we believe that our initial presumptions were ultimately right. Increasing wage growth and tightening of the labor market has increased disposable income. Now that people have their available cash on hand, they are more likely to purchase new homes and given such a great credit environment was another reason why this company will strive going forward. The next company we want to present to you guys is Xylem. This is a company that has positioned itself in a seemingly timeless industry, water infrastructure. For those of you who have never heard of Xylem, they offer a wide range of services that deals with collection, distribution, and returning water to areas in the USA as well as across the globe. For these reasons, we felt that this company was going to provide gains for us as they were consist consistently seeking new market share. Currently, only one out of every nine people have access to potable water, which means that Xylem has increasing opportunities to expand their market share. Xylem also has favorable fundamentals when compared to their direct competitor. In addition to this, Xylem also does a fantastic job at separating the revenue streams, as they have fantastic geographic segmentation that has contributed to this performance against the sector ETF. This, this company has returned double for us since we've held it in our fund, and we see no signs of it stopping. In fact, just based on their revenue segmentation, it's important that we know that 60% of their revenue comes from outside of the U.S. in areas such as Europe as well as the Asia Pacific region. For all of these reasons that Corinne and I have discussed, we truly did feel that this company was going to continuously provide, provide returns for our fund going forward. We would like to conclude our holding discussion with the energy sector, another area where up until a week ago we would have told you we had a 0% holding in. However, one of the lessons we learned in the cafe is to never invest in a company unless you truly understand the underlying asset. 
Now, some of you might assume that it'd be easy to predict the movement of oil prices, given how much it affects our daily lives. But as we've all learned throughout this semester, this is truly not the case, as unpredictable news headlines continuously created huge price movements for the commodity. We learned this lesson the hard way when we invested in Slamberger on September 28th. This company provides oil services to companies across the globe. We felt that by investing in a company that provides services rather than the exploration or production, we would get the energy, to, energy exposure we desired while still being protected from the underlying commodity asset. Now, ultimately, this investment philosophy didn't pan out as the company was still affected by the volatility of oil prices. We decided to sell the company in order to cut our losses and prevent further against the downside, which is a key responsibility that we have as student fund managers. And after considering the volatility and unpredictability of the sector moving to year end, we felt that we could utilize this extra weight elsewhere in sectors that were more poised for more consistent growth. This investment philosophy ultimately panned out as we saw a negative 7.5% return in the sector throughout the year. However, given the recent market shift that we keep, we've been talking about, we decided to buy back in when we saw tailwinds to push growth for the long term. Now, our initial hesitation of getting back into energy is what comes from what many people in the finance industry call being snake bit. We, as well as the groups before us, have bought into several energy companies throughout the year, each time losing out with the volatility of the sector as a whole. But given the recent run we've seen in oil prices, we see long-term growth opportunities in Chevron, one of the world's largest oil producers. We decided to take a 3% stake in the company in order to get the energy exposure we need if the sector is to continue to run. The company is investing in the Permian Basin, which is one of the largest oil producing regions in the U.S., where over 2 million barrels of oil are being produced each day. The basin holds over 160 billion barrels total, and only 20% of the resources have been depleted. Chevron's generation in that region is exceeding expectations, with over 200,000 barrels being produced each day, which is up 30% year over year. On top of this, their liquid natural gas projects in Australia are expected to add over 200,000 oil equivalent barrels per day in 2018 when they reach their peak production. Since the first quarter of this year, their production has already increased 80%, and this growth is expected to continue into next year as well. So this is including our holding discussions, and we'd like to invite up Pete and Ashley to talk about some valuable lessons we learned throughout this semester. Now, not everything in CAFE was glamorous. There were also several brutal lessons we learned during our time here, encompassing both our value fund and our growth fund. One of these was the third quarter earnings of Whirlpool. When searching for value in such an overinflated market, Whirlpool to us looked perfect. As some of you may know, Whirlpool produces household appliances, mainly washers, dryers, and refrigerators. We like this company due to the fact that it expected increasing cash flows as well as strong margins. Before learning about Whirlpool, all I knew was that they made refrigerators. We stumbled upon Whirlpool around 2 a.m. one morning during pitch week and decided to delve deeper. The company seemed to be everything that we were looking for. It was cheap and had been beaten down, but still had catalyst for growth moving forward. Despite these positives, Whirlpool missed their third quarter as earnings per share estimates, <coughs> leading to an initial price drop of roughly 6%. Later that same night, after Whirlpool had already reported their earnings, Sears announced that it will no longer be carrying Whirlpool products after having carried their products for over 100 years. This led to another price drop of roughly 4% and the company stopping out the next morning. Although this was extremely hard for us to handle, as though it was the first time we had been significantly hurt on one of our holdings, it forced us to realize that due diligence doesn't always pay off. Systematic risk is inevitable and the market is a menace in itself. It didn't ask our permission and it certainly won't ask yours. Certainly does not, actually. <laughs> now the last lesson we took away from the past week is that in investing, one can live by the sword, but also die by the sword. The key to gaining alpha is weightings. With our fund having heavy weighting in technology, financials, and industrials, our holdings appreciated significantly throughout the year. As we became accustomed to our growth portfolio running on updates in the market, we were living by the sword. But as all of you know, the sword has two edges, and we learned the other edge very well. During the past week, our fund had underperformed, leading to an initial price drop of an alpha of 1.7%. However, due to this rotation, we decided to change our weightings by increasing our weighting within consumer discretionary, telecoms, and energy. By doing this, we've been able to learn that we needed to key in on these industries because they were the ones that we felt moving forward to be able to grow more. One of our main lessons that we were able to learn is that even though the market, we think we can know the market, we do not, and that the market could shift at any time, and that when you live by the sword, you also die by the sword as well. With all that being said, we don't want anyone to feel too bad for us if we have still performed very well in the year. Without further ado, we're extremely excited to present our growth portfolio's performance, which has still outperformed the market on a risk-adjusted basis. 
We would like to start off by comparing our fund to similar funds with the same objective as our own. As you can see, our fund has performed within the mid-range of our peers, as well as outperforming our comparative benchmark, the S&P 500. While we are extremely proud of these raw returns, something that Doc has always taught us from the first day investments that the only measure of return that really matters is risk adjusted. One way we measure this is through alpha. Now before we calculate our alpha, we must first calculate an expected return for our fund in order to give ourselves a benchmark to compare ourselves to. We do this through the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM, which is, taken by taking, which is calculated by taking the risk premium in the market and multiplying it by our portfolio beta. This is then added to the risk-free rate and gives us an expected return of our fund based on the amount of risk that we chose to take on. We then take the difference of the expected return and what our portfolio actually returned in order to arrive at our alpha. Our year-to-date alpha for our growth fund is 3.44%. Two other risk-adjusted measures we use are the Sharpe and Trainer ratios. To calculate the Sharpe ratio, you take the return of the portfolio, subtract the risk-free rate, and divide that by the standard deviation. So for every one unit total risk we were taking on, we were getting 2.43% return on that. Now moving on to the trainer ratio, this is the exact same calculation except dividing by the portfolio's beta. This is a measure of the amount of systematic or market risk that we took on, and based on this, we've been able to generate 19.45 units of return for every one unit of market risk that we chose to take on. This is more than 3% of the market, and just another testament to the strength of our fund's asset allocation this year. At the beginning of the semester, we were truly playing with fire, as our, our portfolio was positioned to run with the bulls. However, our new portfolio is positioned to fit the current market trends, and with that, we would like to show you our value performance. As you can see, our value portfolio has performed in line with mutual funds with similar objectives. Also, when looking at our benchmark, the Russell 1000 value, you can see that we have performed in line, we have beat that as well. Looking at our, our risk adjusted measures, you can see that we've outperformed the Russell 1000 value on both the total and market risk basis, looking at our sharp and trainer ratio. On top of this, we've been able to generate an alpha of 5.59% this year, significantly outperforming the index in this measure as well. Now that we have shared with you our overall performance for our growth and our value fund, we'd like to invite up the ADs to discuss Greece a little bit. This semester, our group, as in me, my two fellow ADs, the eight student fund managers you see behind us, Doc and Mrs. Mellon, or as we affectionately call her, Mama Doc, got the unique opportunity to travel to Athens, Greece for eight days. For everybody who supported us in future trips, we would really love to thank you, and we'd also particularly love to thank Mr. Hans Christensen for his generosity. Without this generosity, these trips wouldn't be possible. During our trip, we visited Axia, an investment bank, as well as the Athens Stock Exchange and Alba Graduate University. This brought our knowledge of the Greek economy, as well as European markets in general. Now, it's important for all these analysts to see the markets on a global aspect, as our, inner, as our domestic markets are only so much of what we see. It's also important to see that different investors in Athens have different mindsets on where the market's mm -hmm. going to be to year end. It's, and it's important to get the feedback that these, basically, the analysts have to share with the student fund managers. So once again, we'd like to thank everybody who contributed. And before we move on to question and answer, I just want to show a little love to our eight student fund managers. As you saw from our presentation, we had a very wild week as we reallocated most of our portfolio. And I can't say how proud I am of each and every one of them for putting in the time and work to make this almost a flawless presentation. And especially with the help of Dr. Michael Mellon. to invite the student fund managers back up and open up the floor to question and answers. truly love is Boeing. Um, one of the reasons why is they're in a market that has extremely high barriers to entry. So 
they're just this massive company and other small competitors really can't get into with the industry that they're in because they have such high capital expenditures. Um, and their order backlogs of about uh, 4,500, um, especially with oil prices too, increasing their new 787, 787 jetliners are going to do super well. We've already seen extreme high demand for them. Um, we bought the company probably about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and we've already seen a holding period yield of about 10%. So, I don't know, I love them. <laughs> <laughs> Another company that has me extremely excited is fast retailing. Our market is extremely flooded with retailers, so we decided to go abroad. <coughs> At first, student fund managers and I, we were hesitant about putting it into our fund. However, after looking closely at it, we put it into our fund and it's already given us a holding period yield of 4% in two days. The company is absolutely amazing and it's going to take over the world. <laughs> Great job, guys. I really know how hard it is. You know, I know firsthand what it's like to kind of you know, have everything really fall through the floor and have to, have to pick it up in the last hour. That's, that's really tough, so you know, I really got to tip my hat to you guys. Um, on the same on the same note, um, you know, I'm looking at the graph and I see that kind of fall off at the end. Um, I know Doc preaches the sleep test. Um, you guys talked about stop loss orders. If you guys had known uh, with a crystal ball, you know that that the that your holdings were going to go ahead and fall like that. How would you have kind of readjusted your portfolio or maybe you know readjust the strategy um, in lieu of that? So, yes, we did see the tech sell-off, and we really were confident with all of our holdings throughout the entire time, even with this new market sentiment. The only thing that I think that we really would have done differently was change our weightings to what we have done now and change our companies. We were confident, the sleep test, yes, as you guys that aren't alumni know, this is what Doc has always preached to us, that if you can't fall asleep at night thinking about your companies, then you should not be invested in them. And we, every single day, were confident in our funds. With that being said, with the new shift in sentiment, we're happy with our new allocations, and I think the only thing we may would have di done differently was shift these weightings into our new companies that we hold now a little bit earlier. Yeah, I'd also just like to touch on that too. Um, I mentioned like how you know early on in the semester there was skepticism, right? But it was gradual. So like we were seeing earnings plays, and we're seeing um, you know subtle changes, and it actually kind of just over time turned to be a repositioning that. I don't think there's any way for us to, you know, really prepare for it. It started gradually, and then Zach came in one day and was like, "How do you guys not see this? Like the market's literally going to fall off just because of the repositioning that he was seeing." Um, so that being said, it was very difficult to, to tell, and it's, you know, it's tough to turn away from the tech as we've seen through the past year. So, based on that, you know, it was a little bit difficult for us to be able to determine that. But with the fund where it is now, we think that we're we're leveraging against the downside. So going into 2018, we see some of the same catalysts that are present within this past year. So we still see good economic growth as well as emerging markets being a really good player. Um, based on the current evaluations, we're going to have to wait to see if technology continues to lead the market going into 2018 or if there's going to be a new sector that leads the way. But certainly we're going to see some of the same catalysts and we do believe that we're moderately, moderately bullish on the market as a whole. How did you guys handle arguments in that little room? I know you guys all have big personalities, so how did you guys handle different opinions? A lot of yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that like one of the biggest lessons that we talked about earlier, um, like within ourselves, like one of the biggest lessons was working with different opinions. I would hate a company, other people would absolutely love it. We held companies that showed more, like, more risk, more standard deviation, and we would absolutely go at it. But you just need to know that we all have different opinions, and you need to come together as one, and just make sure that you're confident in your holdings. Um, great job, love the presentation. Uh, I'm pretty curious because in the market, obviously, Bitcoin has been a huge topic. Everybody's watching the news every day, that's pretty much all they talk about. I know that it might not be something that you can invest in. Maybe in the future you will be able to, but what's your take on it and where do you see it going? How's it going to affect tech? Yeah, so Bitcoin, I want to start, uh, is a bubble. The real technology, 100% <laughs> bubble. The real technology, the real technology 
uh, in a lore of Bitcoin is really blockchain, which is the underlying technology of uh, the decentralized ledger. Um, we're really going to have to see how Bitcoin reacts when it goes on the futures market on December 18th, because right now uh, it's just a one-way market, it's not shortable. Um, and it really just emphasizes a whole high liquidity environment with quantitative easing over the last few years, just pumping in trillions of dollars. It's looking for anywhere to go, and it's really just a bandwagon mentality. Uh, people see it rising, they know it's a bubble, but they see it rising and they want to go in anyway. And you know that when people that aren't in the investing world at all start talking about Bitcoin. You'll have an Uber driver talking about how we just bought Bitcoin. That's when you know it's a bubble. And it's actually second only to the tulip bubble of the 1600s. So prediction for Monday's going out? We'll say it's, I think it's, it, it will crash. It will. And, uh, first of all, guys, I saw this yesterday. Quick talking about it. Congrats, congrats, you guys. It was really excellent. I do have to say that. But um, one question I did have is all the repositioning and, and hard work you guys put in this semester. Is there one company in your fund or funds that you could sweep right now? And if there was one, what would it be? Absolutely not. We are 100% confident in all of <laughs> So throughout the entire semester, actually, uh, the ADs, they, from our first like tech analysis, we take that before we take CAFE, you know, the alum and I know that, um, they actually compiled an Excel spreadsheet where we started looking at companies, and throughout the entire semester, we had sweeps on deck for, for stuff like this. You know, there was companies that we constantly were looking at that we might uh, feel that it was a good fit to reposition ourselves. So when we saw it in the market, it was relatively easy for us to know like, where we had to go. So from a financial perspective, this is something that we followed like extremely closely. As you know, like you can see PE compression as soon as the media would talk about it, you could see earnings be or rather price changes be uh, priced in. So this is kind of like one of the plays that we made with PNC, right? So we took our funds, or we took our allocation from a city bank, which is ever spot bank, higher multiple, and we put it into a regional bank because we feel that if tax reform does continue to go through. Just given the environment we've seen throughout the year, you know, there's minimal spread between yield curves, money's in the environment, people want to spend it, low interest rate fluctuations, like this is all going to be beneficial, especially to a regional bank, and they should see explosive balance sheets from this, honestly, just given, given the lending environment that we're supposed to see. So we're actually kind of excited about the fact that, you know, it may be actually going through, and again, it's been a really good, uh, or been really fun, I should say, following it and reallocating. Uh, going off that, um, I know there's a few accounting people in the group. Uh, do you see any downsides to the tax reform? And if so, um, are any of your holdings at risk? From, a from, yeah, from an accounting perspective, um, this is something that Doc and I always talked about, like us three, Ashley's an accounting major as well. Um, you know, you'll see companies, in a sense, cooking the books. You know, there's different reporting uh, principles or fundamentals that they follow. So it's going to be interesting to see, just given the way that the rates are going to switch, how these companies are able to offset what they've been doing, especially as we've seen. So it's something we definitely have to look at, but um, I think generally we've come to the consensus that it's going to be pretty positive for all companies going forward. investment right now. Um, they're seeing, as we said in the presentation, incredible growth in China. And on top of this, they also uh, provide a lot of services for pharmaceutical companies, and they're just pouring money into research and development. Um, so that would be one stock that I would suggest. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I know you guys are 
I don't know if you guys, you've been following GE at all. <laughs> this is stuff that I think is way too big to fail. Good value. There is repositioning things, that's all it is. And uh, I followed, I tried to pitch this company and give it in actually before we saw the price fall off. So it's a running joke amongst the group, but I would say to follow it because I really do think it's too big to fail, especially for a guy who went forward. Thanks, guys. Really wonderful job. Um, thank you very how all this great work came out of such a small space in our building and it's wonderful that we now have some great new space for the cafe program to work from uh, hopefully it will be open in the next couple of weeks uh, the construction project has taken longer than we thought but please if you haven't seen the new space make a point of going over and take a look the building's going to be open until five o'clock so you can come in and, and just look around and um, get a take on um, <clears throat> what our students in the future will experience thanks to the hard work of a lot of people. And again, we thank you for being here today. There is a reception in the Bayview room, which is right down the hallway. I hope you'll be able to stay and visit with us and visit with our terrific students. And thank you again, guys, for a really fantastic job. <laughs> 